Good afternoon. Thank you all for uh, joining us here on the live stream uh, of this event, and thanks to everyone who will watch the video of the event um, at their at their convenience. Uh, this event is the long recovery from the Great Recession, public policy, and the working class. Uh, what did more than a decade of economic expansion following the Great Recession do for the working class, and how can policymakers improve the outcomes for the working class based on lessons learned from that long expansion. This will be the broad theme of our discussion today. This discussion is based on a publication, uh, a volume of the annals of the American Academy of Political and Social Sciences titled, What Happened to the American Working Class Since the Great, uh, Since the Great Recession? And the panelists here today have all written chapters for that volume. I was one of the editors for that volume. And so we'll discuss, for example, the importance of labor market institutions, the effects of workforce entry uh, and training programs uh, and uh, uh, other similar aspects of uh, the, the economy coming out of the Great Recession and then the expansion that followed uh, and, uh, and, and policies. Um, let me... Uh, introduce our panelists very briefly and also introduce uh, the subjects on which they will be speaking. Ryan Nunn is Assistant Vice President uh, at the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. Prior to that, Ryan was a fellow at the Brookings Institution. He will be presenting on how labor market institutions matter for worker compensation. Jeffrey Smith is uh, holds the Paul Hine, Distinguished Chair in Economics at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, and Professor Smith will be speaking on workforce entry, including career and technical education and training. Doug Holtekin is President of the American Action Forum, uh, former Director of the Congressional Budget Office, and he will be discussing policies to help the working class, uh, lessons from the Great Recession. And Bell Sawhill is Senior Fellow at the Brookings Institution uh, who will uh, be uh, discussing uh, a topic quite similar to Doug's about, uh, about what we learned uh, from the long expansion following the Great Recession and, and the policy uh, uh, lessons for that going forward. Um, the uh, uh, event will follow a pretty straightforward format. I'm going to kick things off by providing a really brief overview of the volume itself, uh, which uh, I believe, I'm told, is available for free online, uh, but only for the next five days. Um, and so uh, there's, some, there's some urgency there. Uh, and then we will have um, some short presentations from each of our panelists uh, about their, their specific topic that I just mentioned. And after that, we'll uh, have a discussion um, uh, between, between the four of us, I'm sorry, between the five of us, on these issues, uh, and uh, of course, we're eager to take your questions as well. You can submit your questions to my colleague, Mariana Mitchell, by email. Uh, her email address is mariana.mitchell at aei.org. You can find the spelling on the webpage for this event. You're also welcome to submit questions via Twitter, and the uh, uh, Twitter hashtag that you should use to submit those questions is hashtag ask AEI econ. That's hashtag ask AEI econ. Uh, and so uh, with that, I'm going to dive right in here and, and um, again offer a, uh, a, a brief overview of the volume as a whole, um, assuming that I am able to master the technology, which it looks like I'm succeeding at. Uh, so this. Uh, is uh, the cover of the volume, uh, what happened to the American working class since the Great Recession, uh, open access until November 15th, 19 chapters. Uh, thanks uh, to the folks at uh, Annals and Sage Publishing. Thanks to my co-editors, Tim Smeeting and uh, Jenny Romish. And thanks uh, to all the, uh, the people who helped put it together. Uh, including uh, my, my colleague, Mariana Mitchell. Thanks also, uh, of course, to all of our wonderful authors, including, including the four we have, we have here today. Um, the, uh, the project, uh, the project was uh, long, 
um, and uh, the project was interrupted by the pandemic. And so in October 2019, uh, we were standing in, in the middle of, of uh, a historic economic boom uh, uh, in, in, in the middle of, of, of a recovery uh, that was extremely long and that was, in my view, doing really great things for uh, lower income Americans and working class Americans in a way that we, we hadn't seen for some time. Uh, and so we, we uh, kind of hatched a plan to, to study that um, and uh, try to focus the project around the question, what's happened to the American working class since the 2008 global financial crisis and, and the great recession that, uh, that it caused. Um, again, this was prompted by the longest post-war recovery from July 2009 uh, at that point uh, to October 2019. Uh, when we were when we were discussing uh, putting this project together, and and when we were having preliminary meetings and preliminary discussions, it really looked like um, it looked like uh, the the recovery was going to continue. Um, there was there, there you know there was some talk of a recession, but I think uh, uh, it, it it was it was looking like the expansion was going to continue for some uh, for some time, um, and then and then COVID happened. And uh, uh, that really made it difficult for us to, to get the actual work done. We had authors conferences and, and meetings planned that we you know, thought we could push off for two months and then two months became six months and then six months became nine months, a, a similar experience I'm sure to, to all of you uh, in, in your own professional careers and lives. Um, we had a presidential election uh, and all of a sudden we were, we were looking at the expansion Following the 2008 financial crisis, that had that had that had been complete, uh, we were no longer going to be studying uh, an ongoing economic expansion. We were we were we were able to observe the entirety of the expansion that ended with the onset uh, of the pandemic. Um, we look in the volume at three uh, three periods. We look at the Great Recession itself, uh, December 2007. 2008 global financial crisis, uh, the recession officially ended in the summer of 2009. And then we look at what we call the long recovery, which uh, went from uh, uh, the summer of 2009 up until February 2020, um, the economy, the, the, the lockdowns associated with, with the pandemic began the following month, March of 2020. Uh, and we also look at the experience uh, uh, the, uh, of the COVID-19 Pandemic recession uh, and, and and the recovery itself that that experience of course is is ongoing. We began with trying to capture uh, this long recovery uh, and the effects uh, of it on on the working class. Again, not knowing when it would end, uh, but uh, but now now we do know uh, when it ended. We asked three broad questions: How have poor and working class Americans and those at risk of economic uh, disadvantage fared? during uh, the, uh, uh, the long uh, recovery expansion. We uh, look at standard measures of income and employment, uh, but this is an interdisciplinary volume. And we have uh, sociologists uh, who have written chapters and we have uh, public policy analysts who have written chapters. So this is, this, is not, uh, this is not purely an economics volume by any stretch. We want to look at how those low income and working class Americans have fared both in absolute terms uh, and also relative to, to other important groups. And I think looking at both is, is really important. Uh, we wanna look at how the labor market for lower paid workers changed since the uh, Great Recession. And we wanna look at how labor market institutions and public policies uh, changed and reacted to that expansion and the subsequent, uh, uh, the subsequent pandemic recession. There are 19 uh, papers in the volume. We have some uh, broad overviews of the macroeconomy, of the labor market, of measures of material well-being. Uh, we look at population outcomes for key groups. We look at institutions like employer practices and worker protections. Um, we look at workforce training. We look at income support systems. Uh, importantly, we focus both on pockets of success and uh, pockets of problems. I think a lot of the a lot of the discourse around our uh, economic outcomes focuses on on the problems, you know, rightly so, uh, because the problems are, are what need to be addressed. But uh, one one goal of the volume is that it offer a, a more holistic look 
uh, there were some pockets of really uh, uh, significant success, successful economic outcomes and successful social outcomes during the expansion following the, the, the 2008 financial crisis. And we wanna make sure to highlight those. At the same time, there were, there were real, real challenges uh, as well. Uh, the opioid epidemic, for example, some communities uh, that were not, uh, for whom the benefits of the recovery really didn't reach them uh, for a long time. And we wanna, we wanna give uh, uh, attention and shine a spotlight on those, on those challenges as well. And then we um, uh, conclude the volume with two papers looking at uh, policy perspectives, uh, offering views on economic and social outcomes. Uh, and uh, uh, Doug Holtzikin has co-authored one of those and Bell Sawhill has co-authored one of them as well. And so I'm especially excited to have, have Doug and Bell here today to offer their 30,000 foot perspectives on these things. What did we learn? Um, we learned that, uh, that the tight labor markets toward the end of the, of the expansion um, benefited uh, the earnings and the incomes of the working class. We learned that a rising tide did eventually lift all boats, but that a rising tide did not lift all boats equally and a rising tide did not lift all boats at the same pace. Uh, and uh, uh, in an absolute sense, uh, wages were still um, uh, pretty low for, for many occupations, even, even in the really great economy of 2018 and 2019. Uh, as I said, uh, a rising tide may lift all boats, but not uh, at the same pace. And we learned that the timing of the recovery varied substantially by group. Um, we learned that tight labor markets uh, meant gains in absolute levels of earnings and incomes for most groups, uh, but that, uh, but that uh, the gaps between groups persisted uh, in, in many instances. Uh, we learned that there were uh, pockets of great dis, uh, success and pockets of, uh, of distress as well. We also learned that institutional rigidities are important. Um, and that uh, labor market institutions, uh, along with public policies, have a critical role in shaping, in shaping outcomes. But again, institutions and policies, not just, not just policies. Um, and so that's, uh, that's a, a broad uh, overview of, of what you can find in the volume. Again, you can, uh, you can get, get the whole book for free for the next five days. Uh, I, don't know, I don't know what happens on November 16th, but apparently... Apparently, that's you know you know they're going to start charging again. So, um, uh, uh, so take advantage while you can, and and uh, uh, you know I, th I think I think the, the volume does a good job of telling telling uh, you know coming pretty close to telling the whole story. I think I think we touch on on all the you know really important aspects of this of this extraordinary uh, period uh, in in American economic history. This uh, this panel will not attempt to offer a, a comprehensive overview of of the uh, Great Recession, of the recovery from it, and of uh, what we've experienced over the last eighteen months. We're going to focus instead on on some of these labor market issues uh, and on, uh, on 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 policies and institutions. And uh, with that, uh, to, again, to kick us off, uh, Ryan Nunn. Um, how labor market institutions matter for worker compensation. Great, thank you, Michael. And thank you uh, for, for uh, having me on this panel and as part of the volume. Uh, can everybody see my slides? Great. So I'm, I'm really delighted to be part of this, to talk through um, labor market institutions and what they mean for workers. This was a uh, volume with Jennifer Hunt at Rutgers and uh, was, was some work that, that we were really happy to be part of. Now, I should say at the outset that uh, the views that I will express will just be my own and will not necessarily be those of anyone else at the Minneapolis Fed or in the Federal Reserve System. Uh, with that said, I'd like to really uh, just sort of start with the well-documented fact that wage and non-wage compensation inequality have really risen considerably over the last several decades. We've seen relative increases uh, at the bottom of the wage distribution just during the last few years and even the last few months, um, but we are, are sort of focused on those longer run trends. 
we argue that changing institutions have contributed to some degree to this rise in inequality. So for example, falling real minimum wages uh, during the 1980s in particular, raised inequality in the lower reaches of the wage distribution. Somewhat further up the distribution, declining union density in the private sector uh, played a similar role. If labor markets were uniformly competitive, I think this, uh, this focus on institutions would be less important. Uh, but we're learning that uncompetitive labor markets really are pervasive, and that leads to market rents that can be allocated by institutions to some degree. So we are inclusive in our chapter in how we define labor market institutions. We focus on arrangements, practices, and policies that we believe were worth highlighting from a worker compensation perspective. So uh, how have these institutions changed that, that we look, looked at? So as I mentioned a moment ago, private sector union density has uh, fallen quite a bit over the last 50 years. Um, we also uh, consider changes in the real federal minimum wage. We uh, note that, that state and local minimum wages have offset that to some degree more recently, but there's been this long round deterioration in the federal minimum. One institution that we don't look at in the chapter, but that I wanted to note now is unemployment insurance and the take up in it. And that has, has really declined over the long run uh, before 2020, particularly when uh, sort of looking at the population that's typically eligible, the, the shorter term unemployed who are involuntary job losers. In the chapter we do, we look at alternative work arrangements and I'll talk more about that in a moment. Uh, we talk about occupational licensure and its prevalence. So uh, that, you know, having increased quite a bit over the last 50 years, becoming a really core labor market institution. And then we uh, look at non-compete contracts as well. And I'll say more about that. We have less information on how that's changed over time, but we do have some increasingly good evidence about how non-compete contracts are distributed today. So it remains to be seen, I think, what affects the pandemic will have on these institutions, but I would note, you know, there's a lot of inertia to some of these trends. So I'll first turn to alternative work arrangements because I think they are important context for some of the other developments that we look at. So they're defined by contrast to traditional W-2 employment with its full suite of labor protections. The wages that are offered in uh, alternative jobs are generally lower and non-wage benefits considerably lower in these alternative arrangements. And there's research that links this kind of uh, so-called domestic outsourcing with lower wages. Uh, this may have contributed to increased sorting of high wage workers at high productivity firms um, in recent decades. Perhaps surprisingly, uh, there's really no clear increase in alternative work arrangements over the last 25 years or so. It stayed roughly stable at about 10% of the workforce. Gig work, which is not shown in this figure, has certainly grown uh, since the Great Recession, but that's still a small fraction of alternative work in one's primary job, which is what this figure focuses on and, and what our available data allow us to look at. Moving to now an institution that really in some ways is the antithesis of alternative work, uh, thinking about the uh, private sector uh, union uh, uh, sector, we see union density having fallen really dramatically for workers across the board. So here I show you the, the picture within educational groups, and you see that there's just, there's quite a bit of decline uh, for those workers who had a high school degree or less, but declines also evident for other groups. You know, a chunk of the decline in the overall union density uh, rate is about the changing sectoral mix as our manufacturing sector has um, been to some degree replaced by services, but most of the decline is not. Uh, that's also true if you look by education. There is a, a large um, fraction, a little more than a third of the decline in overall density that can be ascribed to changing educational mix, but uh, but, but most of the decline is within those groups. And why do we focus on this? Well, unions historically have made large contributions to wage compression. So declining union density has led to more inequality. 
Um, there's some recent work suggesting that as much as 40% of the decline in the 90-50 wage uh, differential can be accounted for by declining uh, private sector union density. So unions can help workers get rents when those are available in their firm and in their sector. And I think an underappreciated point is that they can also prevent practices like abusive non-compete contracts, which I will talk a bit about now. So non-competes, for those who, who aren't familiar, are contracts between employees and employers that restrict the employee's ability to take a new job or start a new business. And they're everywhere. That's the bottom line of, of the new evidence. They are more common at higher wages and for those with more education. They're more common in some industries like professional and technical services, but they're, they're quite broadly um, present in the labor force. And here, what I'm showing you are some calculations that my co-authors and I did with some, some recent questions in the National Longitudinal Survey of Youth in the 1997 cohort. But we see uh, qualitatively quite similar patterns in the, the pioneering study by Starr, Bashara, and Prescott that really alerted us to uh, quite how broadly um, present non-competes were just a few years ago. The problem with non-compete contracts, in my view, is that workers typically don't understand what it is they've signed or were asked to sign after they've already started a new job. Um, this makes it hard to engage in good faith negotiations over the contracts. And there's, there's evidence that um, this leads to lower wages for workers who are subjected to enforceable non-competes. And this is a particular problem for low wage workers. The, the best justification traditionally for non-competes is that they help employers protect and then share trade secrets with their employees, but that's uh, really unlikely to be a great reason for their use with lower wage workers in particular. Okay, so what, what does this all mean for policy? I think the big picture is that we wanna find ways for labor market institutions to support workers as efficiently as possible. I think sometimes worker compensation and labor market efficiency can be achieved simultaneously, and sometimes there's a trade-off. But just ticking through some of these policy options, private sector unions are, in my view, an important source of countervailing power in the labor market, and their decline has been pretty convincingly associated with rising inequality. So some things that policymakers could do, they could look to increase union density, you could increase penalties for uh, illegal employer actions. You could implement something like card check or an alternative quick elections, um, as well as binding first contract arbitration. Um, you could also look to increase union influence um, and, and in a different way. So for example, there are proposals to um, engage in sectoral bargaining, which um, would, have, would sort of shift the, the focus from the enterprise level to the sector level and diminish some of the pressure on, um, on unionized enterprises. So there's really a, a suite of things that are possible there. Another sort of broad approach that one could take to, to reforms here is to regulate employer practices directly. So the, you know, the minimum wage, uh, in, in my view, should be set to balance economic distortions, including disemployment with the wage gains that workers receive. And, um, ideally, this would vary with local conditions, including the degree of labor market concentration and, and the local wage distribution. Um, turning to other uh, to employer practices that we might want to regulate, you can sometimes tax those um, in a way that sort of allows uh, employers to use them when they're when they're really socially valuable. So, for example, you could require bonus pay for just in time scheduling. And I think we can reinforce worker protections generally by avoiding employer misclassification of workers um, so that those worker protections are broadly available. So for example, limiting independent contractor status to those workers who assume risk for profits and losses you know, in addition to the criteria that are already there in law. And then finally, policymakers can directly address any competitive labor market institutions. So um, I think we're learning that underlying weakness in worker bargaining power manifests in non-compete contracts that often appear uh, abusive in, in some instances. And 
another, another labor market institution that can have any competitive effects is occupational licensure. Um, unnecessarily strict licensure transfers rents from consumers and unlicensed workers to training providers and to licensed workers. And the institution can be unnecessarily exclusionary. For example, when it um, uh, disallows those with criminal records from, from entering a licensed work. But with that, I'll pause uh, and, and really look forward to the rest of the conversation. Thank you, uh, Ryan. And I believe uh, that uh, Jeff uh, Smith is up next and, and here come the slides. Thank you, Jeff. Mute, there we go. Uh, thanks for including me in this conference or this web event, I guess, as it is formally called. And uh, I wanna shout out to my excellent co-authors on our chapter, uh, Bert Barno, who's an old, 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 old friend who knows the insides and outsides of uh, the DC policy environment much better than I do. And Lois Miller, who is uh, a doctoral student in our program at Wisconsin. Uh, we're gonna, you know, part of what we all had to do in our chapters was decide what was sort of meant by the group that we were studying and we're limited a bit by the nature of the data. So we're gonna focus on, on youth in the year shortly after high school. And it's gonna, the exact range is gonna bounce around a lot from graph to graph because it, we're limited by the data sources. And we're gonna focus on 2005 to the, to the pandemic. This is an acronym rich uh, environment in which we operate talking about uh, career and technical education, what to some degree, what we used to call vocational education and ALMP, which is a Europeanism, uh, which stands for Active Labor Market Programs. So it's a, it's a somewhat broader notion than what we commonly think of as employment and training programs, uh, but we, we, we are engaging with that breadth uh, in our chapter. I will skip the outline in the interest of time. Uh, this is education status of 20 to 21 year old. So we sort of wanted to get people who were close to finishing, you know, as they're finished high school would still be in college if they were gonna be in college, uh, at least in the short run after finishing high school and look at what happened to them over the great recession and then into the period of the recovery. And there's a couple stylized facts. Uh, oh, pardon me, this is not education. This is work and education. So this is joint categories of working full-time, that's the FT, working part-time, that's part-time, in school, not in school. And you see the standard pattern at the beginning of the Great Recession that people leave the labor force and enter education because the opportunity cost has fallen. That's how economists like to talk about that. The interesting thing is that in this case, that sort of doesn't go away. You can, uh, what, what happens is that the fraction in school sort of stays persistently higher uh, throughout the recovery and uh, the fraction of, of what Bert likes to call opportunity youth and what the British would call meets, not in education, employment, or training, uh, falls, which I think we would all agree is a good, a good thing. If we look specifically at education status of 20 to 21 year olds now broken down by institution type, I was, I was surprised by, I guess, two features of this. One is that the four-year public graph is going up during a boom. I would not have expected the four-year public line is the second line from the top that is going up during a boom. I sort of would have expected that to go down. Um, and the two-year public line is going down in the period after the recession. And that surprised me a bit, partly because I feel like the, the, the teens were a time of a great emphasis on two-year publics. I think more emphasis than they had received in the past. They're often get short shrift, at least in the academic literature, because the people who write papers about higher education are not at two-year public schools. Uh, they're at a very limited set of four-year public schools, and it tends to be a bit of navel-gazing in this literature. And, and, and I thought we'd kind of gotten over that a little bit uh, in the teens, and also in the policy world a little bit in the teens, that they had sort of been rehabilitated uh, in their role. But the, the enrollment numbers don't, don't reflect that. And that that surprised us, and I, and I think there are things to think about in that domain going forward. Uh, 
I would note too, I don't, I don't have this in my slides, it's in the chapter, um, you know, that the tuition, the sort of tuition, nominal tuition post price for the four years is going up during the teens, uh, but aid is going up faster. So in a sense, the real price is falling and that may account for some of the, of the fact that the uh, enrollments increase even during the boom. Two-year publics are pretty inexpensive all along. Uh, you know, there's proposals for pre-college, but in most <laughs> states during this period, it's not that expensive to begin with. I sort of said that. This is this is sort of what Michael was talking about at the beginning, or Dr. Strain, uh, if we will. Uh, that this is real median weekly earnings of workers for 24 to 25 year olds. Now, so now we're going a little bit older because we kind of get people who are out of college uh, if they're on the, the normative track, and. You know, the thing that we were kind of excited about when we started this volume, and it, and it really was a fascinating thing to be involved in this volume, having started at a time when the question was, how long is this going to go on? And, and we ended with, oh, dear, <laughs> we had a pandemic. Um, but this is what was going on when we started the volume. And, you know, the, the, the thing everybody was really happy about was what was happening at the lower end. So these are, these are medians uh, by education group. The means tell a similar story. These are weekly earnings uh, of workers. If you just use wages, they tell a similar story because hours are pretty, pretty stable over this period. And, and you just see big increases uh, for the lower education groups uh, over the course of the teens. That's sort of the big, we start out kind of big and then we narrow down a little bit. because our, our remit was sort of to speak in particular about sort of skill formation uh, after regular schooling ended. Uh, the U.S. has a very unusual system for skill formation after uh, regular schooling ends. Uh, there's a bunch of formal programs that are run by the Department of Labor, and, and those are highlighted on this, this slide. So the, there's a sequence, MDTA, CETA, JPTA, WIA, WIOA, uh, the last two of which were present during our period. And these are sort of the big federal training programs. Feds put out the money, states and local workforce investment boards kind of operate them within the parameters set by the feds. Um, and there are separate youth programs and adult programs and dislocated worker programs. Uh, there's a performance management system. Indeed, it was in the workforce system that performance management sort of was born in the federal government in an important sense. Uh, there's the job corps program, which is very different. It's a residential program and specifically at young people modeled after the civilian conservation corps uh, long before any of us was around. And it, it is very expensive, it is smaller, and it has, a, a, I think, a bit of, has led a bit of a charmed life, perhaps for good reason, uh, whereas the WIA and WIOA sequence of programs have led a less charmed evaluatory life. So this figure shows enrollment uh, in these various programs over this time period that we are considering. And I wanna, I wanna just highlight uh, two features of this. The first is the levels. The levels are super small. Right? This is a percent of the US 18 to 21 year old population. And those are decimal points there. So these are fractions of 1% of that population. So relative to a lot of European countries, uh, we don't do a lot of this, at least in the context of these programs. And that's an important aspect of what I wanna say here. The second point I will highlight is the big ramp up and ramp down in the Workforce Investment Act adult program and the adult program serves people that we are calling youth, as does the youth program. And that's because there was a big uh, allocation of funds to WIA as part of the ARRA uh, and during the Great Recession. And that is directly reflected in the big increase in, in number of people served. Um, most of the action in career and technical education is actually not in these official workforce programs, but in two year community colleges, which in general combine academic tracks with sort of career and technical education tracks, both in the sense that they're both there and in the sense that the vocational tracks often include a bunch of, of academic training that they might not in other countries. A big issue lurking in the background of this whole discussion is that, is that in the, the separation of these systems in the US for I guess historical reasons between sort of workforce and uh, kind of two-year post-secondary it's reflected in the data sources that you can use. 
It is reflected in the evaluations that get done. It is infected, in, it reflected in the administrative structure in the federal government, right? Some of these things are handled by the Department of Labor, some by the Department of Education. And the result, the net of that is that the system, um, one might say lacks coherence, even relative to a lot of the federal government things in this country. And it is very hard to study because it's very hard. If you get data from a community college, it's not gonna say who was paid for by WIA or WIOA, but a bunch of people were because they contract out most of their training. If you get data on who's at a two-year college, it's gonna be hard, or who's in WIA, it's gonna be hard to know what they studied at the community college. So that's a plea for sort of more and better data. Um, I'm probably getting close to time. There's been some evaluations over this period that were useful. There was an experimental evaluation of the Job Corps, which showed that it produces uh, large gross benefits. Uh, the control group eventually catches up, so it doesn't always pass a cost benefit test, but relative to most programs for youth that have been evaluated in a robust way, the Job Corps is a big success uh, just because it produces those, those gross gains. There was a WIA evaluation uh, that was also a randomized control trial I interpret that differently than other people. That's something we can talk about in Q&A. I interpret it to read uh, that marginal training that we have pays for has a low payoff. I think infra marginal training often has a, a reasonably high payoff. And I think we should do more research on how we allocate people to training in these programs. Uh, there's been little, little programs of sectoral training, which kind of bring in employers and focus on skills for a specific sector. There's been research on um, on career, career tracks, which I think are very useful. And there's been also some really good non-experimental research using state data, which has gotten a lot better in some states that tells us that perhaps the not surprising fact that people who complete courses at two-year community colleges that provide skills that are certified in the labor market and that are in demand, those people do really well. And we should try to organize the system to do more of that, which is easier said than done. Uh, I will end with just some mentions. We have a section at the end that they, at the editors, bless their hearts, let us call the section damn pandemic. So that's what's on the slide. Um, you know, this recession is a bit different in a bunch of ways. People didn't all go to school during the recession because of COVID, right? So it was different in that sense. Uh, there's no oil price shock. There's no housing bubble. There, there doesn't need to be a lot of reallocation uh, in the way that there has been in some recessions. We all paid a lot of fixed costs. We all know how to do Zoom now. Uh, and we paid a bunch of other fixed costs. I'm sure there'll be more, more delivery dinners than there were before, even when the pandemic is all the way done. Um, I think that has implications for how we want to think about uh, the, the fact that this is a different sort of recession in a couple of ways has implications for policy that we should think about going, going forward. Uh, and I will end with the citation and encourage you all to download not just our chapter, but the many other interesting chapters uh, before the free period of five more days comes to an end. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jeff. Um, Doug, uh, what did we learn and what should we do? Well, uh, first of all, let me uh, add my thanks to, to you, Michael, to, to Tim and to Jenny for inclusion in the volume and, and the ability to participate in this event in particular, and to thank my co-authors, uh, Rich Burkhauser and Kevin Corinth for um, their uh, vastly more important contributions to, to our chapter than, than I ever did. Um, uh, the short version of, of the takeaway uh, for us is that if you look at the period uh, in, in the recovery after the Great Recession, uh, the things that some of the other authors focus on, labor market institutions, uh, training, other uh, specific uh, labor market and other micro policies uh, are beneficial, but, but they pale in comparison to the benefits of rapid macroeconomic growth, and in particular, a hot labor market, which generates uh, demand for labor and rising wages. Uh, everyone notices this when they, they look at the period right prior to the pandemic, where we have uh, record low unemployment rates, uh, particularly among uh, less skilled, uh, less experienced workers, uh, communities of color uh, and genders that are not usually uh, benefiting from uh, labor market um, tightness. Uh, all of that shows up in the data quite clearly. And you always wonder what would have happened had we not had the, as Jeff put it, the damn pandemic, which did show up. And, and uh, um, what I really want to do is encourage people to read that and, and you know, uh, look at the, the evidence, which we think 
um, is there to support that. But I also want to point out it does have implications that, that Jeff started to talk about for how we think about uh, this, the recovery from the pandemic recession. And, and it, I think there's some lessons in, in our take on that recovery that are important right now. And, and uh, lesson number one is going to be the obvious one now, but, but I thought was true uh, in April of 2020 and, and, and May of 2020 as well. And that is, you have to pay attention to the supply side of the macro economy as well as the demand side. Uh, lots and lots of attention is paid to the demand side always, but we've now have some experience looking back that the supply side matters a lot. Uh, I was in the White House on September 11th, 2001, and experienced uh, the political pain that came with the so-called jobless recovery from the mild recession we had early in this century. Um, in retrospect, it sure looks like we should have recognized that as we try to protect Americans, we spent an enormous amount of private sector resources on weaponizing and, and, and uh, um, uh, armoring the economy so it could operate in the face of terrorism. We inspected every container that came into the country. We guarded landmark headquarters. We did all sorts of things that diverted monies away from investing in productive capital or training or, or other ways to advance productivity and instead made ourselves safer. Now, that, that, that's a trade-off. But we should have recognized that we, were, that we were making that decision and not been so surprised at the, at the poor growth we saw in the overall economy and in, uh, in employment as well. That's a, a supply side uh, phenomenon. I think the same is true in the pandemic. Um, the, the supply side shock, which is, you know, how do you have a restaurant dinner safely with your friends is an enormous cost shock. Um, and it's hard, hard to produce that in the economy uh, in the presence of the coronavirus. And, and we were going to be faced with um, the, these same kinds of trade-offs on how we thought about uh, macroeconomic growth in the presence of the coronavirus. And I don't think we were especially articulate as policymakers and, and as uh, um, uh, policy advisors in, in doing that. Um, part of the reason is I don't think we look carefully enough at the roots of the pandemic. This goes right to the point that Jeff was just making. 20th century recessions were income-related events. In fact, when I was trained in macroeconomics, uh, the business cycle was often called the inventory cycle because you know the, the, the goods would pile up on the shelves and the production facility would be shut down. The guys would be laid off and the women would go home and uh, there would be no paychecks and spending would cut back and we'd have a downward cycle. And then eventually the, the shelves are bare and they call everyone back to work and they start it back up to produce things. And you get the virtuous upward cycle and trying to understand that cycle was the heart of macroeconomics at, at, at its birth. All of our important public policy interventions were about those kinds of recessions. We, we wanted to replace the income. Unemployment insurance replaced income in part. Discretionary fiscal policies gave people income. The idea was to minimize the downturn, more rapidly uh, uh, accelerate the recovery to full employment, and they were income-related policies. Then suddenly, the, the economy got tricky on us, and the two 21st century recessions were financial market events that spilled over to the real economy, a dot-com bubble, which burst and, and uh, generated a modest recession, but slow recovery uh, after 2000, 2001. Uh, the Great Recession came after a financial market collapse on a global basis, spilling over to the Main Street economy. Again, a, a painfully slow recovery from that. Our public policies were geared toward income-related recessions. We weren't really so sure what to do with this um, wealth-related recession. The most recent one has nothing to do with either of those things. It was the virus and, and the, the threat of infection and transmission caused people to self-quarantine and ultimately for public policy officials to, to lock down and quarantine people. But in the data, it's quite striking. With the onset of the coronavirus in the, in the North American continent, the first quarter of 2020 went down at a 5% annual rate. Um, it, it, that's after growing in January and February. I mean, it, it was a, a very rapid downturn. Two percentage points of that are reduced consumption of health services. People just didn't go to the doctor, they hid. Uh, and, and that downturn is, is a consumption-led decline, which produced a tremendous recession. It was, if you look at the, the micro data by zip code and sort it into to affluent versus less affluent uh, zip codes, the real downturn in spending was spending on services by affluent zip codes. The people who had money didn't go to restaurants, they didn't go to, to uh, hotels, they didn't take uh, cruises, they didn't go to concerts, they stopped spending on leisure and hospitality and other services in a dramatic fashion. And um, point number one is 
that produced real unemployment in the people who provided those services. And that is largely the less skilled, low income communities of color in the United States. So we saw this two part um, downturn and it was the spending on those services that drove those layoffs and, and inability to, to find work. And the second is that there was nothing about the demand management that we produced in the CARES Act or anything after that, that was going to replace the spending of high income individuals in the United States. They had the money, that wasn't the problem, it was the virus. And so to get a genuine recovery, which we started to see in 2021, we had to get better protections, vaccines, widespread distribution of them against the virus. And, and, and that piece of spending came back. And so to do a better job of letting the macro economy help the, the working people, we have to understand why the macro economy is not performing well to begin with. And I think the second lesson here is, you, you really do have to just not run the automatic playbook you have to, to diagnose the reason for the downturn much more carefully. Third lesson is you can't count on the Fed. That comes through absolutely clearly uh, in, the, in, the, in the Great Recession where the Fed did a fantastic job of stemming the downturn, uh, keeping the financial uh, markets uh, liquid and pricing and allocating capital. So it can do a lot to stop a downturn, but it can't do much to push the expansion by itself. And to rely solely on the Fed was extremely frustrating after the Great Recession. Same would be true now. The Fed did a fantastic job in early 2020 of stepping in, providing open-ended commitments to liquidity to allow markets to function. And they did throughout the, the remainder of uh, 2020. Financial markets did their job and did so uh, quite well. Banks provided private credit. There was never real, really a big demand for the public credit programs for larger um, uh, enterprises. And, and so you know, it can do a lot to help damage to the working class but it can't do much by itself to, to, to push the economy forward and to generate the kind of benefits we want from uh, a hot economy and um, a, a tight labor market. And so uh, to my eye, um, you know, this, this issue of maintaining uh, rapid uh, macro growth and a, and a hot labor market is a key, um, but it, it is not something that you do by pulling a lever the same way every time to in demand management. It requires really learning some of the lessons of it's not just the Fed doing demand management. You need uh, other tools as well. And it's not the same kind of demand management every time. Sometimes it's unusual. And that was true this time. So uh, thanks, Michael, for the chance to be involved today. And I look forward to the discussion. Uh, oh, sorry. Thank you, Doug. Um, uh, and I'm glad that you um, uh, got into some uh, issues of, uh, of, of current economic conditions and, and current policy debates, because I, I'd, I'd like us to, to, to discuss that uh, for sure in, in, in light of what we learned from, from, the, uh, from the expansion from the Great Recession. Uh, Bell. Uh, thank you, Michael. And like everybody, I was really pleased to be part of this effort. And I want to first give a big shout out to my co-author, Gary Bertless. And Gary is one of these people who, when he sees data, he falls in love. And so he had to begin by retracing the data on what's happened to middle and working class incomes uh, after inflation. And he went back to 1979. So he was looking at a little longer pattern. And I just want to report quickly that what we found is that there has been some growth in those incomes, slow to be sure, faster than wages to be sure. And one of the reasons incomes, well, there are really two main reasons why incomes grew faster than wages. One, and importantly, is because there are so many more two earner families. So you don't have to just uh, depend upon individual wages if you've got two of them. And um, secondly, because government policy has increasingly supplemented the incomes of these groups, especially uh, in the health insurance arena. But I think um, what the editors wanted was for us to talk about policy as well. And so we did. And we put together a range of policy ideas, uh, many of them um, very much a, a further exploration of what were in some of the more detailed papers, such as the one that uh, Ryan uh, discussed. And I would say that our policy ideas fell in three buckets. Uh, the first one is how do you uh, sustain employment growth? 
And our answer there is through full employment. I'll come back to that. Uh, the second is um, how do you make work pay? Because even if wages grew as they did towards the end of the long recovery uh, for the working class, the absolute levels, uh, as I think Jeff said, were still quite low. And so we need to focus on how do we make work pay? And then the third is this issue of productivity that uh, Doug just discussed that we don't put enough attention on uh, when we're thinking about uh, countercyclical policy anyway. And there, I think, uh, like Jeff, we said, you've got to um, improve productivity by skill building of your workforce. And so that's the education and training agenda. Now in my 10 minutes, I can't begin to go through all of that, but I'll mention a couple of examples. Uh, on the macro, keeping the expansion, uh, making sure that we stay at full employment rather, uh, our main idea there is bring back or improve uh, automatic stabilizers. You can't, you know, Doug said you can't always count on monetary policy to do the whole job. Well, you can't count on the Congress of the US uh, to practice solid discretionary fiscal policy either. So if you make it more automatic, more automatically counter cyclical, uh, that will help. Um, on making uh, work pay, uh, like uh, Brian, uh, we worried about uh, worker bargaining power, and we do think there is the need for some labor law reform to help there. Uh, but in addition, um, uh, you know, there is less competition, as he pointed out, in the labor market than there might used to have been, and the countervailing force of unions has declined. Uh, but we also talk about um, beefing up the minimum wage. And I should note that one of the findings of some of the early papers in this volume, so the more macroeconomic uh, uh, broad trend papers, was that it was the fact that a lot of states has raised their minimum wages over this period of the long expansion from the Great Recession that enabled these wages at the bottom uh, to increase uh, fairly rapidly, especially towards the end of the expansion after about 2015, and especially I think in 2018 and 2019. So um, we have to, to worry about that, or we should talk more about that. We also talk about benefit packages, paid leave, um, and uh, various income supplements that families with low wages need for childcare or for healthcare, um, and more flexible and predictable hours. I think that is uh, another issue that hasn't gotten enough attention. I was glad to hear uh, Ryan talk about that as well. And then finally, um, upgrading uh, skills is just a critical um, objective and policy goal in our view. And one of the ways you do that is through uh, community colleges and apprenticeships. And as Jeff pointed out, um, and it's a little surprising, uh, the two-year college, uh, I think it was enrollment, Jeff, uh, doesn't look uh, so great during this period. In fact, it seems to have declined uh, a bit. Now, as a sort of background for this and to put all of this in a little less academic frame, I want to mention an article that I read in the Washington Post uh, recently describing a group of fast food workers in Bradford, Pennsylvania, uh, working for McDonald's. They make $9.25 an hour, and that was up a dollar from $8.25 before the pandemic. In other words, they got a little bit of a raise just because it was harder to work through the uh, pandemic. Uh, but, you know, the, their, their grievance wasn't just about low pay, it was also about working conditions, very long hours, uh, very surly customers, uh, very demanding customers, and a feeling that they were not respected. And uh, fortunately, we don't have good data on how widespread these kinds of walkouts are now, but they seem to be growing. And I think what they tell you is that there is more bargaining power in a tight labor market. And that um, 
Uh, also, most of these workers know they can get a job elsewhere. And in fact, there they were in Pennsylvania, which has a much lower minimum wage than the New York McDonald's, which was only 20 miles away. And uh, so, you know, that to me, I, I'm in favor of some flexibility, state flexibility, and not raising the federal minimum too high and allowing some local variation. But I think $7.25 is way too low. And you know, on that kind of a wage, uh, if you're a three-person family, let's say a single parent with two kids, you're in poverty, even if you work full time. Um, now, I want to shift a little bit to um, uh, where we are uh, now and whether or not we are going to recover from this pandemic recession and uh, Doug's comments about the role of monetary versus fiscal policy. And I believe that the uh, Fed's new monetary policy framework, which puts more emphasis on employment and a little less on inflation and averages out inflation rates over a longer period before stepping on the brakes uh, is just right in terms of the finding of this volume. And especially if we care about the well-being of the very large number of working and middle-class families in this country and the possible political implications of not doing a, a better job of helping them. Now, the problem will be uh, when people look at either uh, keeping monetary policy uh, very uh, expansionary or look at the uh, Build Back Better bill uh, or even the new infrastructure bill, which is now law, I guess, or almost law, they say, um, gee, that's going to be inflationary. And it's true, we are seeing inflationary pressures now, about 5% a year, uh, well over the Fed's 2% target. But then you have a debate about whether that's uh, going to endure or whether it's just temporary. And most of my macro colleagues at Brookings seem to think it's going to be temporary, but of course, no one knows. And the Fed is going to have a delicate uh, job of figuring out what to do if it doesn't go away. Uh, then we have the argument that if we pass these major laws that do address some of the issues I've just been discussing and others have been discussing and that are well laid out in this volume, um, it's going to be uh, uh, bad for the national debt. It's obviously, uh, you know, we've been spending like sailors and the debt has been going up, up, up. And then you have the argument that, well, uh, we can't afford not to. Interest rates are very low. The rate of return on many of the programs that are in these bills will be maybe higher, probably higher than the current interest rate. And so in the long run, um, these programs have an economic uh, justification. Uh, personally, I think they also have a political um, justification because I wrote a book a couple of years ago that talked about why Trump won the 2016 and later the, uh, I didn't get to the 2020, but why I think he's so popular is one reason is because he, he um, uh, really, um, built on these uh, grievances of, of the working class and made them feel like he was on their side. Um, so, you know, my own preference, uh, if we're talking about current policy and especially about the reconciliation or Build Back Better bill, uh, which is still being um, debated and hopefully finalized and in my view, hopefully enacted, uh, we could all imagine ways to improve it. My own preference would be to favor policies that encourage or at least don't discourage work, uh, don't discourage education or the formation of stable families. Uh, that means, for example, I would have preferred a little more money allocated to the EITC and less to the CTC, the Earned Income Tax Credit and the Child Tax Credit. Uh, more targeting of whatever assistance uh, is provided, and more emphasis on education. Now, the fact that free community college was dropped from the bill is, in my view, unfortunate, given what I earlier said about skill formation and everything that uh, Jeff talked about. 
Um, one way to uh, drop the cost would have been to uh, uh, go for a policy that Richard Reeves and I have talked about called scholarships for service, in which you had to get eligible for free for at least one year of free community college, you have to do a year of national service. Uh, that way, the educational subsidy is an earned benefit rather than an entitlement. Uh, I, I favor raising the minimum wage from $7.25 to at least $12 an hour with uh, the room for states to do more than that if they are in a prosperous area. As uh, our recent Nobel laureate, uh, David Card has shown, this need not uh, affect hiring decisions or retention much. Although the longer run effects on employment, I admit we don't know a lot about and we can't be, it can't be ruled out that employers will do more automation. And then you have to answer the question, well, would automation, is that the direction we should be moving in anyway? And uh, furthermore, uh, even if the economics of it isn't perfect, it may be that it produces a more um, solid society, more, more, more social solidarity. Um, I think that um, uh, that's about all I want to say. I would like my other panelists urge you to read or take a look at the entire volume of the annals. It does have 19 chapters. It, uh, the editors put together or, or called together a really talented group of researchers from around the country. And they uh, not only answered the questions that the editors asked and that Michael showed at the beginning, they, they uh, uh, reported on a lot of really interesting research that is um, somewhat related to that question, but that should be of interest to anyone uh, that wants to know more about the working class and uh, more about um, this uh, great recession and the recovery from it and the lessons learned for the current um, pandemic and recovering from that. If there's time, I'd be delighted to say a little more about what um, Doug said about the uh, lessons we've learned that we should apply to the current recovery, but I think I should stop there to get more questions and more time for others. Excellent, thank you uh, uh, so much, Bell. Um, these were all, all four of these uh, presentations were, were terrific and, and, and they set the stage for a good discussion. I would encourage all four panelists to be thinking of questions you want to ask uh, of each other I, I uh, have all of you on the screen, and I noticed that that when uh, when when each of each of you were talking, some of you were, were were reacting, and so please please feel free to share those those reactions with the audience. But before uh, uh, so, while you're thinking about some questions to ask each other, um, I do want to actually ask uh, a couple of questions um, that have come in from the audience uh, that I think are are are, are quite good. Um, we've had we've had a few questions on immigration. Uh, the um, uh, the topic, of course, is you know what has happened with the working class and what lessons can we learn from both the economy following the uh, financial crisis and from public policy uh, to to improve outcomes of the working class and and uh, a major policy area is, is, is U.S. immigration policy and, and there's quite a bit of debate about, about how immigration, uh, how different immigration policies might, uh, might affect outcomes among, among working class Americans. And so let me just, let me just throw that out there. What, uh, what do you think we learned um, over the past uh, uh, decade or so about immigration? Uh, what should we do with our immigration policy going forward um, based on what we have learned? And how uh, how do you think that your you know preferred immigration policies would affect not just the economy as a whole, but how would they how would they affect the working class? I'm not sure who to who to ask that question to. So whoever uh, Doug, uh, fire away. Sure. Um, uh, I think immigration uh, reform is uh, perhaps the most powerful economic policy lever we have at the moment, and one that we should pull. Um, the starting point for this is that the native-born population in the United States has sub-replacement fertility. Um, 
That's fancy words for the fact we don't have enough babies to even stay the same population size. So that in the absence of immigration, the United States would become steadily older, steadily smaller. We would shrink in economic importance and in, in our capacity to project our values around the globe. The flip side to that is that our entire future is dictated by the choices we make on immigration. And we could uh, dictate the pace at which the population labor force uh, expand. And we can uh, dictate through our choices, the composition and the kinds of people we have working in the United States. That's a huge opportunity. And it's, it's one that we should take. Now the US has a history of, uh, a proud history of immigration being uh, centered on family unification, refugee and asylum status, uh, uh, humanitarian goals that should not be dismissed. It has never really focused on the economic contribution of immigration. Uh, fewer than 10% of permanent visas are issued for, on economic uh, grounds. And so despite this, if you look around, uh, 40% of the Fortune 500 CEOs are either immigrants or their children. Um, uh, immigrants uh, start businesses at a disproportionate rate. They work longer. Uh, they um, hire more people. They retire later. They bring enormous economic vitality. And so if we even tried harder, imagine the, the economic benefits that, that could uh, accrue from a, an, an economics-based immigration reform that that stressed um, the fact that immigrants were going to contribute to the one thing we all share, which is the quality of the economy in which we we live and work. And so, I, I you know, th this I think is is a really important issue that that we need to to move on as a nation. Now, you know, you've heard, I've heard, oh, immigration that that's going to compete with the the native born, it's going to take their jobs, it's going to lower their wages. And um, I'll just point out that uh, you know, in the situation where we had just a massive influx of low-skilled labor to a concentrated labor market in Miami. Um, it's taken about 20 years of staring at the Mariel boat lift to try to find some wage effects out of that uh, enormous uh, event in the labor market. So it's hard for me to be convinced that there is in general a big impact on the working families in America, but from immigration, they benefit enormously from the fact that immigrants are largely complements to the native born population and will raise their wages and raise the, the, the productivity of the labor force as a whole. So, um, I, you know, I, I look at the current immigration debate and it's, and it's depressing to me because it's focused entirely on legalization and not on the things that produced illegal immigrants to begin with. And, you know, we need to, to get ahead of this and, and, and really t take advantage of our capacity to attract to the United States the skills and capabilities that we both want and need going in the future. Um, uh, Ryan, I think uh, I think you'd like to, to jump in. Yeah, I'd just like to, uh, to to add to this. I'd be remiss if I didn't represent my co-author Jennifer Hunt on this because she's done right. some some really interesting work here. Um, and I'd point out two kinds of effects of increased immigration that she's seen in her research. One is that it raises patenting and innovation pretty substantially um, in the United States, and then the other is that it can raise educational attainment of native-born um, residents. Uh, Jeff or Bell, any, any uh, uh, thoughts, disagreement particularly welcome, but agreement also, also allowed? You know, <laughs> since, since I have often disagree with Doug, I want to say <laughs> that on what he said to just now, I 100% agree with him. Uh, and, you know, the National Academy of Sciences did a very uh, in-depth study of this, and they found everything that he just said. Um, and the, you know, I think most economists understand that immigration is good for the country. Uh, the resistance to immigration is cultural. And there's also a split between the federal government and the states and localities because the federal government benefits from immigrants because they pay taxes during their working ages, especially payroll taxes. And the states and local governments get caught with the health care and education costs. But generally, I think what Doug said is right. I, I would like to say three things. The first of which is what Bell just said, which is I agree with Doug. Uh, the, the second of which is uh, I think it would be helpful politically and maybe substantively as well if there were a perception that the system was more orderly uh, yes. and more humane. And I think also there would be, and this might also be a substantive improvement in sense, I think there's a perception that, um, that, that there's sort of a... That, that we're, we're more open to low-skill immigrants than we are to high-skill immigrants. 
that were sort of protecting high paid workers with barriers that were not putting up to protect low paid workers. And I, that is probably both inefficient and unjust. Uh, and so I would, I would like to see some action at the more skilled end of immigration to open things up a bit more. I, I think that's an excellent point. Let me, uh, Ryan, let me ask you a question about, about non-competes. You've done a lot of work on that and, and that was a big focus of your chapter in your, in your presentation. Um, and, uh, you know, on the face of it, uh, in my view, at least, some of these non-competes, uh, particularly at, at, at the low end of the, of the wage distribution, seem, you know, pretty indefensible. Um, but a question that comes up uh, and that I certainly share is, you know, are these, are these non-competes enforced uh, and what's their actual impact on, on the labor market? And I wonder if you could uh, speak directly to that. Sure, I, I think that's that's an important question because if you look, uh, you know, at the amount of litigation that we actually see around non-competes, there's not all that much. So that's you know, I think an entirely reasonable question. But when you start to survey workers as to whether their non-compete is enforceable in, in their state, um, you know, what the likelihood is that it will be uh, brought to bear on them, you find pretty quickly that workers don't have any clear sense of this and that you know, many low wage workers in particular may not have legal counsel who can kind of help advise them on this. And you do see a lot of workers saying that the non-compete bears on their decision as to whether to take a new job to leave their current employer. So I think the, the focus has increasingly become a, a focus on the chilling effect of the non-compete as, as opposed to the, the litigation itself, if that makes sense. And, and, and do we think it has a, a, a chilling effect? Um, and, and if so, why? In other words, if I if I start a job uh, at you know as I as I as I have, I took a job at a at a McDonald's many many years ago, and you know there are a lot of forms to sign and everything. I, I certainly didn't read them. Um, if I if I don't read them, how do I how do I know I have a, a chilling effect? Right. So I think what we what we see here is that, in fact, those non-competes, um, they, they get kind of slipped in with a lot of other forms and the worker may not even be aware that they have them right up until the point where the worker says, I'd like to go to this other employer, take a, a wage increase. And then we see employers letting the worker know that they did sign a non-compete. Um, so I, to, to my mind, you know, that's, that, that's helpful here, but also just seeing the effects of changes in the enforceability of non-competes in certain states that have, uh, that have removed the enforceability of non-competes for certain groups. It, we're starting to see research that shows that that has wage effects. And I think that's compelling as well. Yeah. Um, I, again, I'd like the four of you to think of questions to ask each other, but let me ask Jeff uh, uh, a question while you're, while you're still thinking about that. Um, I, uh, Jeff, you mentioned this in your presentation, Bell, you mentioned it in your remarks, um, and it certainly jumped out uh, to me, uh, Jeff, when reading your chapter, about uh, the uh, uh, enrollment in the two-year publics going down over, over the course of the expansion. And, and I wonder if you could e expound more on that. I, I know that you don't have a, an ironclad explanation for why that happened, but, but do you have some uh, speculation? Are there some, you know, compelling arguments or, or, or theories or hypotheses you'd like to share about that? I don't actually. Uh, it, it's it's somebody somebody should write some papers about it, and if they have, I'd like them to send them to me because I'd be curious. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of good work around community college on other dimensions that I think is exciting and that we don't really talk about for reasons of space in the chapter. And there's been a lot of effort on programs that try to improve completion rates, which are a big issue, not just at the two years, but at the sort of low end four years. Um, you know, a lot of people start, they take out loans more at the four years than the two years, uh, but they may get a Pell at the two year and then they'll finish. And there's an opportunity cost of time. There's an opportunity, you know, there's public funds being spent if they're taking out loans and things. And so MDRC has done this stuff on the ASAP program, which is kind of services that wrap around the community college experience to try to help people through. There's been other efforts to, to sort of improve. It, you know, one, one of the things that the private two years, which are much maligned and often for good reason, do that is not to be maligned is that they are very simple, right? They say, you want to do this, you come here, you take the sequence of classes, and then you are ready to do that. And 
regular public community colleges often are like little mini universities in their own minds. And there's, you know, value to having lots of offerings. But for a career minded student, they can get lost. I need a fair amount of evidence in the literature that we could we could do better at marching people through and that would probably improve completion rates. Um, none of that answers this question about why the enrollment fell a little bit. But I, I would, you know, to my mind, those aspects, the sort of the completion and improving how we run them are, are is sort of more important at the margin than reducing the already low prices. But people disagree on that. Um, yes, excellent. We uh, uh, have about 15 minutes left. Let me remind the audience, please continue to submit questions. You can submit them by email to mariana.mitchell at aei.org. You can find the spelling on the event webpage. And you can also tweet your questions using the hashtag uh, AskAEIEcon. Um, which, uh, which of you uh, panelists has a question for, for, for someone else on the panel? Yes. Oh, that's a question. Because uh, I, I was, the thing that struck me most, I think about Bell's talk was her mention that she would have rather had more EITC and less CTC. Uh, I'd like to, I'd like to hear more about that and about her thoughts and also other people's thoughts about uh, to the extent to which the EITC should sort of expand to childless people. So I guess that's uh, directed partly at me, and um, I like the EITC because it encourages work and it raises labor supply over time. It you know, has a positive effect on employment, and uh, CTC could have a negative effect. I'm not saying it, it will or that we know that, but it certainly doesn't have the incentives that the EITC has built into it. And if we need to uh, increase labor force, uh, to get more growth, then, you know, we should want that as well as many people feel that uh, they're paying taxes and they are working very hard themselves, sometimes at two jobs, and they don't want paying taxes for other people for whom work is not necessarily called for or required. Um, now, that doesn't mean I'm very much against the CTC, not at all. I like the idea of its refundability, although I might include a bit of an earnings threshold there. Uh, I think it goes too high in the income distribution, uh, not just the expansion of it, but the original CTC that was in the 2017 tax bill goes up to four people with $400,000 a year. And nobody is going to convince me that somebody who has $350,000 or $400,000 a year needs a child tax credit or is going to spend more money on their child if they get one. So one way to think about it is it is simply one more tax cut. Uh, it happens to be restricted to families that have children under 18, but otherwise it's just a tax cut. And I think we had a lot of tax cuts back in 2017 and we don't necessarily need more except perhaps at the bottom uh, where you have the refundability issue. Uh, Jeff, to answer, uh, Another component of your question, I, I think we definitely should be expanding the generosity of the EITC for childless workers. Uh, I think there's a, a, a good amount of um, evidence, some of which I've, I've produced myself, that, that, that demonstrates that previous EITC expansions have increased workforce participation among, among targeted populations. Um, and we need to increase workforce participation, in my view, among uh, among uh, childless men, and I, and I think that would be would be a, a good way to do it. Doug, did you want to uh, get in on that? Oh, I, I just wanted to take the opportunity to return the compliment to Bill, as we do disagree on many occasions. She is exactly right about that, and the EITC versus the CTC. And I would say with more vehemence, but she's right. <laughs> um, let me. Let pretty me pretty vehement. Uh, Oh, <laughs> it's excellent to have, to have it's getting vehement. to be the holiday season here. <laughs> I like I, I like vehement agreement. It um, doesn't make any sense to give it the same CTC to someone making ten thousand dollars and a hundred thousand dollars, and that's what the bill is. That makes no sense. Yeah, I, I agree with that, and I think Bell. I think it's actually even a little bit worse than than what you said. Uh, I the audience should double check this, but I think. Uh, the CTC hits zero around four hundred and eighty thousand dollars of, of income, which is which is I think uh, I think I think really remarkable. Um, Doug, let me ask you a, a question about something you said in, in your remarks. You 
yeah. you wanted to stress the point that that the Fed can't do everything on its own, um, yeah. and that and that we need uh, fiscal policy, we need um, uh, some microeconomic policy uh, as well as good as good monetary policy. I I completely uh, I agree with that, but um, you know a, a potential counter argument to that. I, I think is the labor market of 2016, 2017, 2018, and 2019, where uh, the uh, main main actor there, I think, was monetary policy um, and uh, the Fed allowing the unemployment rate to go uh, well below uh, what what many economists thought uh, was was a was a was a safe level uh, of unemployment. You know, when when the unemployment rate uh, hit six percent, you started to hear calls for um, for the Fed to, to start increasing interest rates rapidly. Certainly when it hit 5%, you started hearing those same calls and, and the Fed uh, continued to, to, um, to engage in, in accommodated monetary policy and, and, and easing financial conditions. And that seems to have generated uh, or at least significantly contributed to the hot economy that you, that you I think, rightly point to as, as being the best labor market policy we have. How do you how do you think about that? Am I am I wrong about that, or or, or do you have other thoughts on that? So um, what you're saying is that the Fed didn't stop a hot labor market. It could have and it didn't, but it, it's not obvious to me they created it, and which is my point. It's not obvious that there was some discretionary Fed policy move that generated 2017, 18, 19 labor market conditions, and that's that's the key. Now there, there's there has an already been an enormous fight about sort of the fiscal side of that ledger and, and whether you want to attribute that labor market to um, uh, a, an Obama-style stimulus at full employment by the Trump administration, right? That's that's one explanation versus the virtues of better uh, corporate tax policy in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, which I have some sympathy for, but which um, not everyone uh, buys into. And that fight will continue until the data can dis- discriminate better. But I, my point is that the Fed didn't do it. They, they didn't stop it, but, but they didn't do it. Um, now, let me ask you a question. Uh, and again, I, I you know, think of questions for each other uh, while, while Bell's answering this. Um, one of the things you stress, Bell, is the need for workers to have greater bargaining power. And, and, uh, and I, I'm detecting some friendliness toward, toward labor unions in, in your remarks. Is there, is there a trade-off here? Um, would stronger bargaining power and would stronger uh, labor unions benefit incumbent workers, but would, would, would they also reduce employment among lower skilled workers, more vulnerable workers? Um, and and if, you, if you think that would happen, how do you, how do you balance that? Uh, how do you balance those two competing forces? Uh, Michael, my phone rang in the middle of your asking your question, and so I muted myself. Let me. You, you just muted yourself. I'll come back to that in just a second. Oh, because your phone is actively ringing. Um, uh, uh, Jeff, do you want to take a swing at, at answering that question? Uh, that was much too macroy for me to have any thought about. <laughs> Doug, Ryan? In terms of framing it, I mean, I. I, I hope everyone realizes just how hot this labor market is that has generated this kind of bargaining power. So every month uh, people get the employment report and they stare at the unemployment rate and the, the, the net jobs is created in the economy. I go right to the index of aggregate payrolls and try to see how fast it's growing because that's number of people, hours those people are working and, and how much they're getting paid every hour. Um, two months ago, that was growing at an annualized rate of 18%. That is labor demand on steroids, okay? And, and in the past, it slowed down to 7%, but that's a very strong demand for labor that has produced the ability of, of the Bradford uh, folks to, to, to walk off. And, and, and I thought I heard you earlier say you were getting a new job when you said it was McDonald's. I was struck by how hot this labor market really is. Um, so, you know, I, that's, that's sort of, you know, the current uh, version of that. Now, that's been driven a lot by my question when, when the, the genuine labor economists want to weigh in on this. Why is it that we haven't seen labor force participation rebound from where it was in February 2020 to where it was in February 2020? I, I'd be curious what everyone's take is on that, but that's the, the supply side of this genuinely hot and tight labor market. A friend of mine saw a sign um, hanging on uh, a, a, a fast food restaurant 
uh, window that said that um, that the restaurant would increase your wage by your existing wage by two dollars an hour if you if you come and work there. And I and I I thought for a minute about whether or not I should I should take <laughs> up on that. Um, because, you know who doesn't who does who doesn't want more money? Uh, uh, Bell, would you like to either answer my question about? Uh, uh, unions reduce employment on the one hand, but help incumbent workers on the other hand, or would you like to uh, address Doug's question about why uh, really rapidly rising nominal wages, if not real wages, rapidly rising nominal wages uh, have uh, not been sufficient to allow the workforce participation rate to, to recover really at all since the summer of 2020, which is, which is a pretty long stretch of time to have flat participation? Well, let me take the second question first, and we'll see if there's time for the uh, first. Uh, I think that, you know, in October, we've seen uh, women pouring back into the labor force. And, you know, a common sense reason for that is because schools are opening and people are getting vaccinated and life is returning uh, to a point where they are not so sort of stuck at home. And uh, granted, we are not back to where we used to be, uh, but male labor force participation has been sliding for many decades. And as uh, you're one of your colleagues um, who uh, has written a whole book about that, and I think it's really hard to say exactly what's going on there. Uh, female labor force participation uh, has also leveled off even before the pandemic and then took a dove during the pandemic. And there is pretty good research that's very suggestive that that's because uh, it's so hard to combine work and family. We don't have much childcare. We don't have paid leave. Uh, we don't have predictable hours. Uh, and uh, that does make a difference to a lot of people. But I think another thing that's going on, uh, obviously there's been the fact that people uh, Bank accounts have been kept relatively healthy through various kinds of assistance. They have a lot of savings right now that gives them a cushion to be fussy. Um, I also think that there's just a psychological thing going on here, which is that people are rethinking their lives and their careers. It was like a disruptive shock, uh, the pandemic. And now they're reassessing, do I wanna go back to that job? Do I want to live in the same place? Uh, do I want to work uh, as many hours as I'm working now? And uh, they can afford to be a little bit choosy. So I think it's a very mixed uh, picture uh, with lots of possible reasons behind it. On unions, um, I think what I liked about uh, Ryan and his co-author's paper is that they made the point that you know, unions have been able to get a wage premium uh, at various times when this has been studied, but that that is usually thought of by economists anyway, as a rent, uh, you know, extra pay. But he and his co-authors, uh, co-author emphasized that if the labor market is becoming less competitive, and that really is an unfair bargain, then you need some institutions on the side of the workers uh, to advocate for them and to provide a more collective uh, action. But I don't believe unions are ever coming back to where they used to be. And so I'm not in favor of putting a lot of emphasis on that. In my last book, instead, I put a huge amount of emphasis on the need for work for employers to train and retrain their workers, but to get a tax subsidy for doing that, because otherwise they won't. And um, that we really um, need the employers to be doing this because as Jeff suggested, it's the sectoral employment policies, the training programs that are tied to what an employer needs that work best. And if you put that in the hands of employers with a tax credit for training, um, then you create exactly the right situation for encouraging this productivity that Doug talked about, uh, but without relying on government programs or on unions. 
Ryan, do you want to do you want to quickly address uh, this trade off I'm laying out? Well, I, there was there was also a related question on my mind um, that I think gets to kind of a different question you asked, which was about labor market tightness, and I'm I'm thinking. I'm wondering to what extent um, unions will be helpful for some workers to kind of retain some of the benefits of the current uh, the current labor market. That's an idea I've seen Aaron Sojourner and others sort of talking about. I think that's an interesting part of this. But but certainly to the broader question about exactly um, what private sector unions do. You know, we know they they confer wage gains. We know that they have effects on inequality. I think where it's it's less clear is in an uncompetitive labor market characterized by rents, you know, what the implications for efficiency are. And I think that's the subject of a lot of interesting work. You know, um, I have excellent. one more, I have one oh, more ahead, argument no. about, about unions, if I, if I may, and I know I'm taking up too much time here, but, um, you know, if you do focus groups with working class individuals, which I have done around the country, what they will tell you is they don't want handouts, they want jobs and they want well better paid jobs and better benefits. And unions do that. Uh, government, you know, a lot of economists will say, oh, well, because of the inefficiency, the presumed or alleged inefficiency of unions, uh, we sh if we're worried about people at the bottom not having enough money, the way to handle that is with taxes and transfers. But, you know, that goes against the kind of respect and dignity uh, that that group wants. And I think that's increasingly important and has political implications. Um, excellent. And we are at 3.30, which I believe is the, uh, the time we've agreed to end this. Um, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, end this by asking for uh, predictions. Uh, right now, uh, Congress and the president are uh, uh, engaged in, a, in, a, in a, uh, a long process of trying to pass uh, the Build Back Better agenda. Um, and uh, I'm not looking for comment on uh, on whether or not it's a, it's a good agenda or how it could be improved because we don't have enough time for that. But um, uh, I'd like to know uh, what, uh, what, what you think will happen um, uh, if you would like to venture a prediction. If not, that's, that's completely fine. Uh, Doug, I know you will want to venture a prediction, so I'll start with you. <laughs> um, I have said all year that it's inconceivable to me that the Democratic Party can leave 2021 without passing some part of the president's campaign platform. And that's what the Build Back Better bill is. And so they'll find a way to get to yes on something that, that's out of that. Um, I now find it conceivable that that doesn't happen, but I still think it will. Well, It will be messy, but it will pass. The whole thing. Well, yeah, I mean, yes, yes, but basically. I mean, you know, they keep shaving it and changing it, yeah, but yeah. yes. Ryan, you're welcome to take a pass. Uh, I should pass I on this one. Uh, Jeff? <laughs> they haven't had a few good weeks. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I'm uncertain. Less, uh, I, much less higher probability than I used to have. Yeah. Um, excellent. Well, thank you all very much for, for, this, uh, for your great presentations and, and for what I think was a great discussion. Let me thank again everybody who tuned in. Uh, to the live stream and, and thanks to everyone who will who will watch the video uh, later on at their at their convenience. Thank you so much. Thank you.